All right, let's call this meeting to order. Is there anything else I need to say? Just that, right? That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first we have a roll call. All right. Chair Amy Wilson. Here. Present. Vice Chair Marie Hoda. Present. Um, Bryn Dunning is not present at this time. Colleen is not present. Scott Gilbert. I'm present. I, I got a text from Helene. She had a work conflict and wasn't able to make it. All right. Thanks, Scott. All right. Sarah Harkness. Here. Guy Mason. Present. And Austin Stryker and Andy Sikaris is not present. Um, staff, we have Director Christina Underhill, Library and Cultural Arts Manager Mark Mollis, and children's librarian, Kimberly Powers. And we have English School's Days on Jen Hubbard. Sorry, Jen. That's okay. I always miss you, sorry. Um, okay, so I don't think we have anyone from the public here. If we did, it would be time for public comment. Oh no, first approval of minutes, sorry. There you go. Okay. Approval of minutes. I'll move to approve the minutes. I'll second. Okay. And Andy Sakaris has joined us. Great, thanks. Okay, and now, um, so. We approve the minutes, right? That was done. Right, and then vote. Oh yeah. Okay, vote everybody. How do we do that? I don't remember. Say, say uh, all in favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any nays? No, okay. And, and Brynn is here now. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yes. Do I have to say that it's approved, Guy, or do it is just is? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, the minutes are approved. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Give me a Sorry, second. I'm late. Everyone was having a little bit of internet issues, but I got it all figured out. All right. Um, okay, so um, public comment. We don't have anybody um, from the public here. Um, so next on the agenda is uh, reports. Excellent. All right, am I transmitting? Yes, okay, cool. Um, so uh, March 2021 is, uh, is gonna be an interesting month for, um, statistical, for statistical reasons. Uh, obviously this is the month that a year ago we shut down. Um, so days of service in March 2020 was only 13. Um, days of service in March 2021 was 31. Um, so, for additional context, I did also send along the statistical report that was generated for the March 2019 board meeting, which includes information from March 2018 and 2019. Um, so it, that I'm not going to be referencing it very much here, but I did want to include all that um, so that you all could peruse it at your you know uh, at your time. If you have any questions about that document or how it relates to the numbers you see here, please please feel free to shout. Um, so uh, anything that jumps out here, um, I just try, I'm rereading the numbers with you. It, it all seems like what you'd expect to see um, in that uh, we did have, even though we were only open for 13 days in March 2020, we had significantly more physical visitors. Um, kind of will give you an indication of what traffic is like in the library currently, which is to say that it's a lot slower than it was before we shut down. Um, now we are feeling like that's steadily increasing. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that we are, even though we are open uh, seven days a week at this point, we're open for limited hours. Um, so some of that is uh, that people are a little bit reluctant to come back to the library due to COVID. Some of that's that we have limited hours. Um, so we're just not quite getting as much foot traffic as we were before. We expect to see that turn in, uh, over the coming months. Um, browsing through here, um, in terms of our circulation, um, this is the month where we're seeing that we are outpacing the circulation that we saw in 2020. 
um, specifically uh, our physical items circulation, 6,000 for this for March 2021 versus uh, almost 5,000 in March 2020. So we've turned that corner. Um, but if we were to pop over to look at the 2019-2018 um, uh, numbers, physical materials circulation was in the 12 to 13,000 range. Yeah. And so, you know, you're seeing uh, that we've recovered somewhat, but we're still not anywhere close to where we'd be under normal circumstances. Um, but the digital circulation is continuing to do well. So it's been a year since everything shut down. And at this point, I think it's probably fair to say that the bump in digital circulation is, is, gonna, is, is durable. Um, I think we'll, we'll expect to see that continue. And as we continue to promote various digital collections, we're hoping to see that that uh, sticks around for the long term. But those numbers just continue to increase over time. Uh, let's see here. Any questions about any of this? I think from, from there, it's all pretty straightforward. Do you see any correlation of why we jumped over 2,000 registered patrons in the course of COVID? What sort of led to that big increase? Um, you know, uh, we would do we do periodic purges of our patrons. Um, so basically, if they have expired cards after a period of time, we purge the old records. Um, and so I suspect that we had completed a fairly recent purge uh, as of March 2020, but we have not done a purge in quite some time. Um, so I, I, I think that that number of registered patrons will decrease significantly when we, when we do a, pur a purge. And I was actually just talking to our access services librarian today um, about uh, initiating a, the first purge we've done in the last year. So that said, um, I do think we, do, we had a lot of patrons who were signing up for library accounts for the first time to be able to access the digital collections. Um, so I'm hoping some of that, it represents new patrons. Um, and of course, anybody who's coming in to do, use our computers, um, we're, we're, we're handing out a lot of computer use cards, um, which is when somebody um, doesn't want to get set up with a full library card, but does want to be able to come in to use the computers. A huge number of those uh, people are uh, new users who are getting a computer use card for the first time. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Almost too late on that one too. Um, I had just seen, uh, if you go back to it, there was a drop in the Facebook numbers, but an increase in the website traffic. We, yeah, we talked about that last month. Um, it's It has to do with the way reach is calculated on Facebook, which makes me think it's not going, at least for this year, not going to be a very useful metric for us. So we talked about some other ones. Um, I, I haven't replaced it yet. I'm not sure what the uh, protocol is for replacing the way we handle, the way we do these statistical reports in the course of the year. Uh, I'm, I'm, we may change uh, what gets reported out in terms of our social media numbers um, in the next month or two. I just haven't, but to be honest, just didn't give it much thought. But uh, Austin, what we talked about last month, um, and Andy had some good insight about this, um, and it had to do with the, that the way Facebook calculated reach um, changed significantly. Um, or actually, uh, it wasn't that the way they calculated it, it was that Facebook was actually um, providing less visibility to public organizations. Is that correct, Andy? Yeah, they changed uh, the way that the reach versus paid versus organic reach and some of the metrics around post engagement. Um, so I think across the board, we saw uh, Facebook reach crater pretty hard. Right. I just thought that was a supportive correlation actually that given all of those changes, the website traffic is still continuing to rise, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, website traffic is pretty strong this month, but I think that may also have to do with the fact that we launched a new website, um, the city of Englewood did. Um, and so I think there was a lot of clicks of just people kind of exploring the new website. And, right. um, and I, I can tell you, uh, at least about 100 of those were me clicking around and trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the action plan then. Um, 
want to report. So one of the top goals, of course, being to restore library services. Um, as, as I mentioned in the previous uh, statistical, statistical report, for the first time since the pandemic, our circulation numbers are up. Um, we have announced to staff and we're starting to plan around the idea of restoring full operating hours and services to the extent possible uh, by, uh, given public health guidance by the end of May. So the specific target date right now is Monday, May 24th. We will return to our normal operating hours. Um, goals at that time include um, restoring, uh, we will no longer be quarantining library materials. Um, we will uh, resume uh, assessing fines normally for library materials. Uh, we will um, reopen the public meeting rooms um, and, the, and the study rooms. Um, so that, that's really, we're targeting that as kind of our, our back to normal date. Um, another thing that uh, we did just this week was that we're no longer um, counting the number of people in, in, who are coming in and going from the library for capacity purposes. Uh, we know that under public health guidance, our, our ability, our, our capacity limit is um, significantly more than the sort of arbitrary number we had assigned. Um, and so uh, we recognized that the library was not feeling excessively crowded. But we were having a handful of times where uh, people were queuing in the lobby waiting to get in and it was creating some crowding in the lobby which frankly felt less safe than just allowing those people to come into the library straight away and so we went ahead and did that uh, we made that change and uh, it's been successful Kimberly actually who's on the call um, was the supervisor here this weekend and uh, supervised that and said that we had no issues over the weekend we, we are saying that if the library starts to feel crowded to an unsafe degree um, someone, somebody in management who's on site, uh, uh, myself or one of the supervisors, has the ability to make the call um, to go ahead and temporarily uh, close the library doors or stanchion off the entrance. Uh, we'll station a security guard and, and ask people to wait to come into the library until enough people have left for uh, have left for to feel safe. Um, and with that, we've been able to reopen the north doors um, into, into the library. So you can now enter the library from both directions because we're not having to count everybody, which means we're not having to route everybody through a single door. Um, the other big thing that in terms of recovering from COVID that happened this last month was in multiple programs, including some of our uh, book clubs and um, story times on Tuesdays and Fridays um, have returned in person. The, uh, since we're talking specifically about March here, the in-person story times on Fridays uh, came back in March. Thanks again to Kimberly, who <laughs> is, is on the call. Um, and, and as of the start of April, she has begun doing those in person on Tuesdays as well. Uh, we have um, the intent plans to uh, throughout the month of April. We have some other programs that will be uh, in person. Um, usually when we're doing these, we're using the community room that's on the second floor of the building. It's a much larger space than any of the meeting rooms we have inside the library. Um, and so that way we're able to have uh, a decent number of people, but with very reasonable distancing. Um, and of course, we're still uh, adhering to uh, Tri-County Public Health, uh, or Tri-County Health Department's uh, mask mandate. <laughs> All right, I think we could scroll to the next one. Um, we, in March, uh, launched the new website. Um, and part of that was launching the new events calendar, which has been a really good thing for um, helping to, pro to promote our programs. Um, when patrons are coming to the library and asking about our programs, the events calendar is visible. And we're able to link to that um, in some of our um, things like the email newsletter. Um, we met with our uh, marketing team um, and, can't, and, and improved some of our internal processes around how we're planning programs, around how we're um, using that to feed into a print calendar um, as well as the, the events calendar on the website, um, which is pretty um, basic stuff in terms of marketing yourself, but it's something that we just frankly did not have processes in place for before. Um, so I'm happy that we're moving in the right direction with that. Um, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, the email newsletters are our most successful um, uh, uh, way of marketing ourselves currently. That's where we get most of our registrations. Uh, if we're trying to promote something, that's usually the, the, when we send the email newsletter out, that's when we get a lot of interest. Um, so we've been using MyAma as a platform for that. The city of Englewood, though, is moving to Gov Delivery. Um, so there's people, the staff members responsible for those newsletters um, have been assigned training for that platform and we'll be switching to it uh, starting in May. Um, and then finally, um, sort of an outreach uh, uh, activity that we participated in was the City of Englewood's extravaganza event. Sounds like a guy may have been there. I'm sure a few of others were as well. 
um, because that was on March 27th and it was um, held at Pirates Cove um, and uh, various uh, partners in the community as well as um, departments of the city of Englewood were there handing out uh, eggs with candy and treats and and, and little goodies for the kids and um, my family came through and it was it was a lot of fun so I was I was glad that the library was represented at that. Okay, um, scrolling down to launching a new website. Um, the March 8th was the launch date for the city's uh, new website. Um, we talked about that at the last board meeting. I kind of showed you around and, and got some really great feedback. So I just wanted to take a moment here to say thank you to the library board for your feedback. Um, I know there was um, talk about how we really need to make it obvious how to get a library card. Um, and then there was some, uh, it's just some general comments about improving uh, the navigation and certain elements of the site. Um, and we were able to make most of those uh, changes immediately. Um, and so I hope uh, you, you've all been able to take a look and see that that feedback you know, had, had an impact. Um, let's see, great. Uh, making other improvements to the library, um, electron locks have installed on the public restrooms. Um, this is uh, something we talked about doing uh, over the last year. Um, it, it, it's something that has a few different impacts, um, but specifically we've set it up right now so that the restrooms are open during the day. They will lock down at 4.55 p.m. So on days where we're closing at five o'clock, that gives them, that locks them down a few minutes prior to when we close, which helps to get people uh, out, out the door, which is sometimes a challenge where we'll have people who enter the restroom and are you know sticking around for 15, 20 minutes after we close. Um, and it also means that in the evening when we have fewer staff present and there's greater potential for uh, problematic behavior inside the restrooms, that they're, that they're secure, that they can, um, we can let people in either via buzzers that are located at one of the reference desks um, or via the electronic key card that staff members carry with them. Okay. So in terms of um, some of the social services we have on offer, which I know is uh, an agenda item for later in the meeting, so I won't belabor them here, but we did meet or, uh, meet with a PD case. Uh, the police department has a case manager from All Health Network um, that they're partnering with named Brittany Golden. Um, she is working with a lot of um, the homeless in the community to help them with uh, fi find shelter, more long-term housing, um, any, any sort of uh, mental health or substance abuse uh, uh, resources that they might need. Um, this is something, this is an individual that we think would be really valuable uh, to be able to refer out uh, some of the people who come to the library. Um, so she's going to be presenting at an upcoming staff meeting for us. Um, the little free pantry that we set up has been getting regular use. We've had no major issues with that. I, no, no minor issues either. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm really proud of that we did in April, but we were doing the work to prepare for it in May or in, or in March. Um, was to work with Innovative Housing, which is um, a low-income, no-income housing assistance program in, in this specific to the city of Englewood. Um, they needed uh, a registration site for, they basically do a 48-hour open enrollment period um, uh, for the, the housing assistance that they can offer. And um, the, it's like a choice enrollment program. And so the library uh, served as a registration site. Um, and thanks that meant we dedicated a couple of computers and we had staff who were knowledgeable about this, the registration process so that when people came in, they had somebody to talk to and a place to go. So. All right. Um, in terms of improving access to local history materials. Uh, in March, we went ahead and made the uh, Langwood Local Library, the historic archive of physical materials that we have. It's available now to the public by appointment. So um, this is uh, the link to email us is on the website, on the history page, or on the historic archive page. Um, people can email and set up an appointment. Haven't had anyone take us up on that yet, but um, we, we look forward to it. We're, and the plan is, the next step is going to be to take the resource guide that we have listing the what we have and um, put that on the website so that it's visible to everyone um, and then that way if somebody sees something that they're interested in and uh, 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 researching or if there's something that they want to come and, and, and see in person that they'll be able to work with us to do that it's not the sort of thing that we can just make open access to the public because it is in a secure staff area and it is something that 
you know, it's a lot of boxes of photographs that have been carefully sorted, that sort of thing. We wouldn't want people just browsing through it and getting it all out of order. Um, but we, we wanted to make that more uh, accessible to the public. Um, and the staff who were kind of in charge of the historic archive had the clever idea, which uh, I kind of kicking myself for not thinking of, which is to collect, start collecting COVID era materials from around the city uh, under the assumption that that's going to be of interest to future generations um, since we are living through history. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty cool uh, small initiative. I know where you can find a lot of masks every yeah. parking lot. So. <laughs> that's right. Dirty masks, <laughs> circa 2021. <laughs> Truly a historic item. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, so our, our adult services librarian has resumed offering one-on-one uh, -on -one technology tutoring appointments. This is sort of informal. It's not something we're widely advertising, um, but it's really a great service for the patrons who need personalized assistance. And and, and uh, Michelle, our adult services librarian who does these appointments, is just really wonderful. It's just so patient, um, very knowledgeable, and, it's, and most importantly, just really good at working with people who have uh, low technical literacy. Um, which is really knowledge is important, but patience is everything when working with 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 those with those users. Um, and we also met with contractors to plan the installation of the projector in the tech lab and the TVs that we have for the meeting rooms. Um, and it, it, after getting uh, some bids back, it looks like we're going to have to talk to our IT department about how to proceed with that because it, it, some of what we need to do is going to be a little outside of the budget that I have to work with right now. So, moving through. Okay, I think that's all we have for this month. Could I ask a question on number four? Um, when you when you talk about the access to the historic materials, you're talking about library um, materials, right? It's not the historic society stuff, correct? Yeah. So there's yeah, we we do have a archive that the library owns of historic materials, um, and then the historic preservation society also has very similar materials um, that are housed in various places around the library. So sometimes it's a bit of a mental juggling act remembering what belongs to whom, but um, the library stuff is very organized and very meticulously labeled. And so that's usually the indicator of what belongs to the library. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that as a slide against the Historic Preservation Society. It's easier for us. We, we, have, we always have access to the building. We always have access to materials and you know our staff have been trained in this sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have two quick questions. Um, is there anything that we can do to partner potentially with the city's comms team or our marketing crew <clears throat> to sort of make a big splash about the library being reopened? I'm seeing other districts do it. I think people are just hungry for content. So I don't know if there's anything we can do using the city resources on that to, I don't know if it's putting it in the, I forget the name of the newsletter that goes or the little booklet that goes out or you know i don't know if there's yeah, the, dollars or something to that effect sure. yeah there's the Englewood citizen and the rec guide and and yeah that's something that we're we're, we're starting to think about we're definitely going to use the community <clears throat> the communications department to make a big push for that may 24th date um we want to make sure that uh that everyone's aware that that's coming and um we're not doing anything just yet because it's pretty far out um but it's definitely on my on my agenda right and then I've noticed the there looks like there's a big plan or at least a discussion in the community about redevelopment of sort of the civic center area um, coming up. Um, I think it, it would behoove us to be ready to be involved in those conversations as a board. I would encourage folks to attend and I'll figure out a way to chat it or um, I don't know if someone from Inglewood could send it out, but it looks like there's going to be a big redevelopment that's going to be sort of an impact on the library and sort of the development around the library. And so I think, um, I think as a library board, we should be ready to answer questions and, and be involved as much as we can in that process to support the library. I would really like that. Um, Christina, do you, can you think of where that process, where, where, where that's at? It's in the infancy stage um, when I asked, so when's the library getting moved kind of as a joke? 
they uh, say oh, 10, 20 years, we don't know. So it could, it, it's probably not going to happen for at least 10 years because there's still funding mechanisms that they need to get in place and, and build up funding to make major changes. But, you know, I guess if the right developer came in and wanted it tomorrow and had the funding to move forward with it, they could. I just don't see that happening. But Andy, I agree. We'll keep you all um, involved in um, when there's updates to give, definitely we'll give those. They just formed the DDA board, the downtown um, district authority board. So um, that's the first step and there's many more steps ahead of us. But like I said, I'll, I'll keep you informed when we get some more information. And we may even have the community development team that's been working behind the scenes with the redevelopment process come and do a presentation to you in the future. So any other questions about that or should we move to new business? All right, new business. <laughs> it looks like that is me, <laughs> new business. Um, so Mark and I talked about having me come and talk a little bit about um, summer reading and our plans for this year. Um, Surprisingly enough, last year, despite being closed the entire summer, we did pull off summer reading, um, the program and the events. And this year, um, it has been a balancing act in trying to figure out where to go with it, how, how in-person to go, how virtual to stay. Um, right now, um, there's kind of two aspects of this. One is the actual reading program where kids sign up, they read books, they get prizes. Um, we are still planning. Um, we have one for our, our babies. Um, that's to encourage parents to just get board books and read board books to their babies. Um, then there's one for kids up to age 11. And then we have one for teens and our teens just, um, it's the same concept. We just have them read 24 hours instead of 10 hours. And um, we are still intending that all of the kids who sign up and complete the reading programs will get a free book and they will get um, <laughs> term prizes as they go. Those are usually fairly small prizes, um, but we're having to do a, a, a little bit of adjusting to that. We used to give them one prize for every hour. We're actually adjusting it to um, one prize for every two hours. Um, the reason being that um, we are a little tight on funding this year, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But um, so those programs will still be there. Um, last year, it was an online registration. We sent the records by email. This year, our intention is to offer both. Um, we do get to have teen volunteers in the library this year. Woohoo! We're excited. The teens are excited. Got about um, 14 teens. Um, ready to come in and do that with us. And they are a big help in getting those registrations. So um, families will be able to sign up in the library. If they're not comfortable coming in the library, they can still sign up online and we'll just email them the reading records. Um, they'll also be able to pick up their prizes in the library um, or they can set up to pick them up curbside. Um, we're it used to be that we had this really cute little treasure chest and they would put it down on the floor and they dig through it to find their prizes. Um, not feeling comfortable with that yet this year. So um, again, fewer prizes also makes it easier for us to just hand the kids what they want as opposed to them digging through. So that's the reading portion of it. And then the other side is our events or our programs. And we have decided to go about half virtual and half in person. So for our kids, um, our Tuesdays will, uh, our Tuesday programs will have one every week for the 10 weeks of summer and they will be entirely virtual and they will have take and makes. So families will be able to um, pick those pick those up. Um, you know, when we started the take and makes last summer, we started with 20. We now are at 45 for most programs. Um, and that's pretty much where we need to cap it, um, partly for money, partly for sanity, because um, <laughs> there's only so many of those you can put together. 
But um, so that'll be our Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, we're gonna try doing in-person programming. And we did an in-person program last week um, for, <laughs> believe it or not, a birthday party for an inflatable rainbow unicorn. But um, it was <laughs> well attended, loved by all, but um, we held two sessions in order to allow as many families as we could, but also allow the distancing. Um, we did it in the community room. And that was our test point for the summer. So our plan is that on Thursdays, that's the type of thing we'll do. So it will be by registration, but we had um, 50 people attend the rainbow program. And I, I think that's what we'll probably see this summer as well. That's about the max of what we can handle. Um, with our tweens, we're gonna meet one day a week and um, some of them will be via Zoom, which is the way we've been meeting with them for the last year. And then we're gonna do probably four programs in the park so that we can have them in person, but we can be outside and again, have that distance. Um, our teens, we're going straight half and half. We'll have five in the park and five virtual. So, um, and then we will continue with our teens. We've been doing um, teen, teen hangouts once a week for the entire year that um, since COVID started. And we have a pretty regular group of, of kids who surprisingly like hanging out with librarians. So, um, so those are kind of our plans for programming. Um, so talking about the budget a little bit in the past, Englewood Schools has provided us with a pretty solid chunk of money um, to help with the summer reading because they feel like it benefits their students. And due to obvious circumstances and their need to spend money on keeping their students safe, um, that money is not there for us. They were able to donate some, but not nearly the amount they, they normally have. Um, that's the reason of, you know, adjusting our, our prizes a little bit and, and, you know, trying to cut down where we can, but we do still have a gap. So my other reason for coming today <laughs> is to ask whether the library board would be willing to fund about a thousand dollars of our summer reading program. So Is, is $1,000 what you need or is that, will that close the gap that you need or do you need additional funds on top of that? Sort of what does that look like? So it will, it will close the gap. Um, I, I mean, I have a budget to work with. Um, it will allow us to also have budget for fall programs because I try to keep an eye on that as well. Um, we do have some SCFD funding that helps cover some performances. I did forget to mention that we are going to try to have live performers Wednesdays during the day in June and then our kids stage performers um, on Tuesday night. So SCFD helps cover some of that. Um, and then, like I said, my budget is the, the main part of that. Um, but yeah, that just extra thousand dollars would, would close the gap. So, I mean, Mark has seen my, my budget spreadsheet <laughs> um, that has peeled apart every possible, you know, piece of what summer reading is going to take. And um, that was kind of the hole that was there. So. I am partial, but I absolutely <laughs> support. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Amy. I just wondered how, if Debbie knew how much we have like we have, have we spent any of it this year yet? I don't think we have. I don't think so. You have not. You have three thousand. Oh, okay. Oh. Good. And we always are at that crunch at the year end. So I'm glad somebody's <laughs> thinking about this in April. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll ask again: Is a thousand all you need? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will certainly take more, but um, you know, I I also don't know what you all may see you know, coming up in the future. So I, I won't, I won't be greedy in my request, but, um, you know, that well, I would certainly take more if you wanted to. I, I've been through five end of years where we're like looking around, like, should we buy toothpaste or what, you know, yeah. where it's just like, <laughs> like yeah. so uh, I, look, I'll make a motion if, if a thousand would close your gap, but you could use more, I and anyone you know can disagree with this. Certainly, I would move for twelve hundred to go to the summer reading program. I, I just can't think of anything 
that the library does more important than getting kids to read you know that's yeah. Yeah. Right. that's pretty core that was the number I was kind of thinking to yeah and come back and ask for more if you need more yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. If, yeah thank you I do appreciate that so do okay. I need to for formalize that in some yes. way yeah I'd actually, I was going to push it a little higher, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I, I did want to just comment that I really love the, I guess this doesn't affect the take and makes, so but I, I love those so much. And I think the uh, summer reading program is really great. I did think there were, I don't know about the, the philosophy of giving like the one prize for every hour, because I, I think we got, and we just got all the prizes last year. And I, a lot right. of them were kind of like things that I thought were questionable, like full of phthalates or something that didn't really want the kids to put in their mouths. But yeah. um, so I I'd rather had I'd rather have fewer better prizes than some of the little dinky ones. I will um, second that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fair enough. Some of them, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I, I would motion for uh, fifteen hundred dollars for um, children's program or summer reading program, whatever whichever one it is we're supporting. I would I would second that because like I said, and you've been here too, guy. You've been on longer than I have. I mean, every year in November we're like, holy cow, you know, we didn't we didn't do anything with our money. Yeah. I think and we usually this, give this seems like a fabulous purpose. Yes. Yeah. I think we've been giving like five hundred for the performers too. Yes, and, you have done that in the past. Okay. All right. Or well is that all good? more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I do. I do really appreciate it, and the kids will too. Okay. I guess we okay. should. Do we need? Do, do we need to vote? Yeah. Um, so, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone? Anyone against? Okay. So that passes. And thank you again. Sure. Anything else, Kimberly, or was that all you had? I think that's it, unless you have any questions about that mouthful that I shared with you. <laughs> I have one thing, which sure. is that, um, I, are you doing, is there an adult summer reading program happening this year? I don't know. Do you know, Mark? Yeah, is so, one? so Michelle is not planning an adult summer okay. reading program. She likes to do an adult winter reading program. Right. Um, cool. um, is there, is, is that okay? I mean, yeah, the yeah, feedback. yeah, a couple of years okay. ago, there was, there was basically zero, um, like promotion of the adult mm -hmm. one. And okay. so I had talked about putting, pairing that with the children's, but if that's not happening, then I think that's no issue. I just was yeah, going to use different... like the children's expertise at promoting things to get <laughs> other things out there. So I would just say, absolutely, yeah, do that. <laughs> I would, yeah. I would also have us think about considering, and this is not a this year thing, but figuring out a way that we could potentially set up either an Inglewood Library Foundation or something that we could go out and raise money for programs like this from foundations or corporate sponsors or things. I know we do some sponsorship with like the Halloween party and the extravaganza. I know there was some sponsorship dollars. I don't know how that works with the library. I don't know if the city attorney can provide us with some, some guidance on that, but I think this seems like a complete no brainer that is some organization would sponsor the toy giveaway for the summer reading program, like, and get it paid for. So it doesn't have to come out of, you know, you know, library dollars or, or uh, Inglewood school district dollars. Like I could go sell this all day long if we have a legal way to collect it. So I think let's just put that sort of in the back of our brains for a way to sort of think about either sponsorships or branding opportunities or, you know, we don't want the NASCAR effect, but I think, um, mm -hmm. but I think that this would be something that I, I could see a local business stepping up and just paying for right out of their pocket and not having to stress about it. And it, so a couple things on that, um, uh, one, um, Andy, I, I know that this is an area of interest for you, and it's something that I, I, I've talked to Christina about as well, um, and I know it's something that uh, I think, you know, it, it hasn't risen to the top of my to-do, but it's something that I'm very interested in talking to you about about, about further. Um, and, and I think when Christina and I discussed it, we, we had discussed it um, uh, the, the elements to which it has to be a board-driven thing, not something that we as staff are going to be initiating. 
Um, and so uh, uh, Christina, maybe will help me explain how to walk the line carefully. And maybe, maybe that's maybe this is a more appropriate agenda item for a future uh, for sure. uh, board meeting. Yeah. Um, but then I also wanted to mention that um, Kimberly uh, does arrange partnerships with local businesses uh, currently as part of putting summer reading together. And um, Kimberly, do you have any uh, status on, on are, we, are we able to get any partnerships for this one so far? Um, I've only started today reaching out, okay. sure. um, yeah. but based on past experience, um, we get quite a few coupons from, from area businesses. So usually Cold Stone, Chick-fil-A, Texas Roadhouse, um, those are our big ones. Um, usually Pirates Cove and Bellevue Train um, Farm do something for us as well. Um, there's a couple other ones I'm going to try to reach out to as as well to kind of add add to that pot. But uh, but usually what they do is they give us coupons and then when the kids finish and they get their book, they also get an envelope an envelope of coupons, which is for some of them as exciting as the book. So back back to the Pizza Hut book days. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Oh, I love <laughs> wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for Book It. Um, <laughs> I always good. think of Pizza Hut and, and Elitches. That's what they always gave away when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 Or Lakeside, actually. I think it was Lakeside. Lakeside was, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'll offer for myself. I won't speak for other folks. If there's help, I can be Kimberly with that. Like, or, you know, if you can send me like the packet, I'm happy as I'm out and about talking to folks to pitch it and connect. And I'm, I'm always happy. I'm a fundraiser by trade so I'm never oh, afraid cool. to go ask for things so um but if there's any help I can be please please tap me in if if it's appropriate sure and then, thank you um, we could have Debbie add this to the agenda I don't know if you want to do it next month or, or a future month but we can have it like you know prepared for what needs to whatever information we need Yeah, I don't think it's it's anything critically urgent. You know, I think it's, you know, maybe a 2022 sort of plan to build it out. But I think just having the discussion would be helpful at some point this yeah. year. Yeah, I can tell you this last month or two has been the first time since I've started that I've been looking at the budget and having that flinch of, oh, th this, this, this might become a problem at some point. So yes. <laughs> but that increases the sense of urgency. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's easier with more money. So yeah, <laughs> that's right. Any other questions for Kimberly? All right, thanks, Kimberly. Um, Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, old business update on services and resources in the library for um, people experiencing homelessness. Yeah. So, um, Amy, I know you added this to the agenda or wanted this back on the agenda, but I, I, I did make some notes. So I figured I, if there was a, if this group wanted to have further conversation on that topic, I, I'm happy to be here for it to answer questions. But I did want to give a couple of updates. Um, we, we talked uh, last month about the Little Free Pantry, um, some of the, the things that we're excited about with that, and also some of the concerns that the board had. Um, and I, I, I mentioned earlier, but it's been, it has been successful so far. It has had light to medium use. It's not as if it's getting emptied out daily. Um, and we haven't had any issues with it. Um, but I wanted to step back and, and kind of explain some of the logic behind doing that. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the homeless uh, population that uses our library, um, they can be a challenging population in some ways. Um, and, and, and a lot of the times our goal is to um, de-escalate the most difficult interactions that we have with them. Um, and I would say that those most difficult interactions uh, will often come because they are dealing with um, basic needs that aren't being met. Um, so they might be sleep deprived um, or they're hungry. Um, I, I mean, we all know the phenomenon of being hangry. Um, and so what really sold me personally on the idea of the Little Free Pantry was when a staff member who was, who was proposing it explained that this would be a way to help, you know, calm the hangry people who were coming into our library and having have really challenging interactions with staff is a way to, hey, get, grab a snack, they step outside the library, they have the snack, then they can come in and use the library and not, you know, be, as, be in as difficult a position. Um, and so like I said, it's been, it's been successful so far. We haven't had any, uh, any concerns at all. Um, 
with uh, with the uh, we we talked last month about the possibility of doing a community fridge where we had been uh, approached by um, Cafe One Hundred and Eighty as well as, same, as students from St. Mary's Academy uh, about doing that. Um, we went ahead, uh, sent that along to the city of Englewood's homelessness action team, um, which is a group that meets monthly and is comprised of representatives from various departments for the city. Um, they invited, um, cafe 180, as well as uh, a couple of representatives from the Sheridan library, um, part of Rappahoe library district, uh, who, who are also installing a community fridge, uh, to talk to us about that, about that initiative. Um, what we learned in the course of that um, is that, that one of the biggest priorities for um, the organization that puts together these community fridges is that they be located outside. Um, so if one does end up going up in the city of Englewood, it would not be inside the library. Um, so I don't know if there's any role for the library in terms of moving this forward. Uh, really, this is something we've turned over to the homelessness action team. Um, and if there are any further updates, especially if they um, directly impact the library, I'll certainly keep you on the loop. But since it would be located outside, there's there's not really any direct impact on on the library. Um, we're putting together, I mentioned previously, a resource center. Um, what this is, is is printed information, basically a way of consolidating all of the different pamphlets and stuff that we have. Um, a lot of these pertain to social services, housing, shelter, food, clinics, etc. Um, but there's also multilingual resources. There's resources for seniors. There's community events. There's things, you know, we get uh, promotional materials from places like the Museum of Nature and Science. Um, and so we have a staff member who is an artist who's going to do a mural wall. And we're going to theme this as the sort of the resource forest. Um, and so that's coming in. And then the last thing um, regarding services to the homeless that I wanted to mention, um, and, I, and I've talked about it before, but it's some of the security upgrades that we put in place in the last year. Uh, so the new camera system, which gives us much greater visibility um, into all the different reaches of the library, and that has really helped us to address some uh, patron code of conduct violations, even over the last couple of weeks, we've seen the benefit of having a much better camera system. Um, the electronic restroom locks, which I talked about earlier in this meeting, um, and then, of course, um, be bringing our security in-house, having in-house security staff. Um, all of these things have been really uh, beneficial to our ability to make sure the library is uh, safe and welcoming to everyone who, who wants to use it. Um, so that, that's kind of the update that I had. And then I figured I'd turn it over to you all for questions or for if you wanted to keep uh, carry on a conversation amongst yourselves around this topic. Thanks, thanks for the update, Mark. I appreciate it. Have you, uh, can, by the way, can you hear me? I've got these stupid earbuds yeah. in. Like, yeah, okay, not clear. <laughs> okay. Um, are when you when you talk about the uh, potentially beneficial effect of a pantry on uh, patron behavior, are are you seeing that happen? I realize it's probably hard to quantify, but but would you would you say you're seeing less challenging behavior, less problematic behavior um, as a, in connection with the, the pantry? It's not, that, that, it's too difficult to draw that uh, direct connect, direct connection. Um, we're, we're not seeing a, a huge amount of really challenging behavior from our patrons currently. Part of that's that we have lower traffic um, in, in the library and, um, you know, it, part of that's just everyone's in a weird spot, you know, coming back from COVID. Uh, most of our users have been really compliant with patron code of conduct, with mask, uh, mask mandate and all, and all that. Um, we do have, you know, a, a occasional code of conduct violations. I wouldn't say that um, those have been in any way associated directly with, our, with, with the homeless population. Um, so, you know, there are people who are using the library who will walk by the pantry, grab a couple of things out of it. Um, but we're not really seeing any, it, it's one of those things where if you didn't know it was there, you might not even notice. Well, personally, I'm still waiting for my second vaccine to get two weeks old before yeah. <laughs> I go much of anywhere. Um, but where is the, and, and keep in mind, I all, I lose all sense of direction as soon as I walk in the library because the building's at an angle. So north, south, east, okay. and west aren't going to help. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right now, it's located just just inside the entrance of the side that goes out to the traffic circle. Um, okay. So we're, yep, yep. So just inside there, 
Um, if you walk in those doors, right to the left, right, right to the left. That's the, that's the worst instruction direction <laughs> I've ever been given. But you know what I mean? It's just to the left of that entrance. That's kind of like a little nook too, right? There's like a little nook. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Kind of out of the way. Um, there's no mm -hmm. seating there or anything like that. So it's, it's definitely not turning into a hangout spot or anything that might be a concern. Yeah. And I have visited the library this last month and just seeing the pantry, the free pantry eased a lot of my concerns. It's, I, I think it's extremely visible. It's really clean. It's well kept. Like I don't, I think some of my concerns about the free library in my head, I was picturing it like not in a visible location. I don't know why, but <laughs> Some of my concerns were more like, um, I know some of the other little free pantries in the community have been vandalized or misused. And I just, I don't see that happening just based on what I saw. Cool, that's, that's really good feedback, Sarah, thank you. But if you see anything that is a concern, you know, I'm certainly interested to hear it. Do you have a concern if there's a fridge outside that like litter is gonna increase? I know that we've got a guy at, I don't know, three or four blocks from me on Logan who put out a fridge in his yard and like we've noticed, visibly noticed more trash in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. um, but I think, you know, is there a plan with Inglewood maintenance or whoever sort of maintains the outside space to sort of keep an extra eye on it? I mean, I am, to be honest, I'm against putting a fridge outside. Like I just am. Um, it may make me a horrible human being, but I like, I, I get a free pantry inside, but like just a free for all fridge outside at all hours, like I have a problem with, and I would encourage the library to think hard about that, but it's really not in my lane to say yes or no, but, um, but I definitely would expect if there is a free fridge, trash pickup to be increased, litter cleanup to be increased and not on the Inglewood library staff. So like, I would expect the Inglewood city to provide a plan on that. Yeah, I, I think Andy, that's that that that's those are definitely the kind of considerations that the homelessness action team, which was discussing this possibility, uh, those were the sorts of things we were talking about. Because yeah, obviously, you know, depending on the location of where 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 the, where that would be placed, you'd have um, you have those concerns, and then you'd have the question of who's responsible for any sort of maintenance and cleanup, and you know, the organization that that, that puts in that installs the community fridges. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cite the user experience that they've had where people say, oh, they have, they've had no issues, this and that. But, you know, if that's your observation, then that, 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 that's, that resonates with some of the concerns that I would have around something like that as well. Um, but, you know, we're not responsible for the outside of the civic center. Um, and so it's really, it, I feel like this has gone uh, in a direction where I, don't, I won't have decision-making authority over whether that's something that the city decides to pursue. Um, and uh, we, nor would the library have, um, you know, responsibility for maintenance of the of the potential uh, 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 litter that is that's associated with it. I had wondered about the same thing. I I would have to say that uh, Andy mentioned, but um, it, and I I bet I know which end of town you live in, Andy, because I've seen the the refri at least one refrigerator on Logan, um, but. Um, but what you're saying, Mark, is since it's outside the doors of the library, that's that's somebody else's uh, decision, then, correct? On the refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, and I and I don't know if it's something that um, Christina, do you know if there's any sort of further interest in that? Um, is it something that's going to circle back around to at the next homelessness action team meeting, perhaps? Yeah, I'm not sure when we're going to talk about it again. It's not necessarily top priority for the homeless action team to address just yet because there's so many questions. The comment our police department made was, "If we put it outside, it's just going to walk away," and I can see that happening. Yeah. And so that's a consideration. And so we're happy that there's other community partners um, involved with this, you know, Cafe 180. It may make sense to put a, a refrigerator outside of their facility. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of roads we have to cross still to figure this one out. It was not as simple as the little pantry to just put something up as kind of a pilot, see how it worked. If it was successful, we'll keep it there. If it's not, we'll do something different. But so far it's been successful. So um, yeah, it's it's. I don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow, but we'll keep you all updated if, if there are changes or if we hear talk of something going going on. 
but if it does go outside the library, like Mark said, it wouldn't be on the library to maintain or clean up. It would be part of our facilities team or a contract that we have uh, to maintain the, the City Hall campus area. Um, and, and EAF, if you've heard of that before, the Inglewood Environmental Foundation, um, they hold that contract part of it. So there's partnerships that have to happen. So again, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you. Um uh, so in the, the resource center, or I'm not sure if I'm using the right term, but the, the uh, mm -hmm. where, where is, is that located in one particular place in the library or is it? Yeah, um, where we're, yeah, where we're planning to do it is, um, so visualize again, um, where, where I was describing, you walk in through the circle side doors, right? And you right. Turn, turn to the left, walking over towards where the computers are. Um, there's a corner wall. It used to be the young adult section. Um, mm -hmm. And then they took out the shelving and then there were just some tables, like some tables where people could set up for with their laptops. Um, often you would see people using those tables to take a little bit of a nap. Um, we didn't like the uh, sort of visual of, of the way those tables were being used. It just felt kind of sloppy. Like they had sort of a sprawl of cords all over the floor and um, so we took out those uh, tables. Um, currently, that's where we've moved the self-check machines to keep them physically separated from the circulation area so that we, you know, um, so that the staff can manage the hold shelf without having people go through and touch all the materials. Um, eventually, the self-checks will move back to where they were prior to COVID. Um, and so that corner, um, sort of between... Um, so that 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 circle side entrance and the computers and the fiction section uh, uh, just on the opposite side of the the space called the nook if that sounds familiar Scott I, I hope yeah, I'm describing I know. where this is okay as long um, as long as I don't have any compass directions I know where you're talking about <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so that whole corner is just a big blank space right now uh, other than the fact that we've moved self-check machines there. So um, that's that's where it's going to go. And, that, and those two walls of that corner are where um, uh, one of our staff members is planning to do a mural. That sounds great. Yeah, I think it's going to be really cool. Just one more question for me on the logistics of the little free pantry. Who is keeping it stocked? And how is that happening? <laughs> Um, that's such a good question. Um, we have uh, a couple of community partners that we've okay. that are basically is said to us um, and then have demonstrated it up to this point that whatever you need will, you know, don't that they will be able to provide, you know, supplies okay. for it. Um, and so we've had no trouble keeping um, a flow of we working with community partners, uh, a flow of goods to go in there. Okay, so that's not an ask of patrons either. No, no, okay. we're not asking for donations. Okay. You know, um, my uh, look. This has been helpful, and I appreciate it. And I and I'm glad to hear uh, some of this. Um, definitely. Um, I mean, my my cons my concern in general is seeing what happened to Denver Central, where it yeah. became, and and so, I, what what is there to be learned from the way that Denver Central went to uh, to avoid that being the way Englewood goes? Um, I think there's that's a that's a very big question. Um, I think oh I know are... <laughs> I've got all night yeah no. yeah yeah um, you know I think by trade we try to be empathetic you know we we try to create a warm and welcoming environment for for anybody who wants to come in and use the library as long as they're able to adhere to the patron code of conduct i know that's true for us i know that's true for every library i've worked at and i know it's true for denver as well truth be told i don't know um denver's central branch quite as well most of my um, professional background has been working at the suburban libraries um so you know the the um uh, volume of the or the, the percentage of our users who are themselves experiencing homelessness is, is higher than I'm accustomed to, but more similar here at Englewood to what what is seen in Denver. I know that they um, have had some really um, uh, smart ideas around things like uh, I remember visiting their community technology center um, on the where where they have all their computers a few years ago. 
and they had set up a room that um, where they screened movies and it was a place where specifically for their homeless users where they could go, they could just, there was a movie on, they could sleep, they could be left alone. And it was a way of kind of drawing as you know, drawing those users to a space that was really set up to meet the, the needs that they had and, and to, you know, you're not trying to force a separation between them and the general library user population but you're using smart environment design and uh, smart uh, sort of layout of the different services that you have on offer to give them an, you know, give them what they need while not uh, disrupting the use of the library for others. So another thing that they do uh, really effectively is um, to try to uh, uh, maintain um, the, the children's area is sort of a separate area of the library where it's not being overrun by people who really have no business being in the children's area. Um, that's, that's something that we are you know, really working to emulate. Um, we certainly want to make sure that our children's area feels like it's a place for families with you know, you know, young children. Um, and uh, I thought that one of the most valuable pieces of feedback we got from this board over the last year was the suggestion to move the teen space over to that same side of the library or to move the, to the young adult collection um, so that we're physically separating out these different you know, user groups so that the library can uh, appropriately meet the needs of all the people who are using it. Um, so those are some of the lessons that I draw from them um, off the top of my head. Um, but I know that that's, they've had, you know, a mix of, of, of mixed success, let's say. Um, I definitely, I think the comment was made at the last uh, uh, board meeting here that you didn't want to see, or somebody said that they didn't want to see the library become a day shelter effectively. And, and it's something that, you know, we think about a lot. Um, it, neither do we, because our mission is to, like I said, to provide a welcoming and, and, and safe environment for everybody who comes into the library. And if it feels like a day shelter, it's a very welcoming and safe environment for a certain segment of our users, but certainly not for all, you know, certainly not for people who aren't looking for that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to think about how we can use our space effectively um, and how we can um, have services that are appropriate for different sets of users and to make sure that, that we're not, oh, <laughs> mingling users who really don't want to be around each other. Um, this is a delicate conversation. I'm sorry if I'm occasionally, you know. Oh, it is. I mean, I'm so. certainly being very cautious, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I have a, not to be TMI, but um, I had a longtime family friend who was homeless and was in fact murdered in a homeless encampment last year. So wow. I'm not, I'm, yeah, no, but I'm, so I'm not like, anti you know people experiencing homelessness by any means I, I i am concerned about the um the mission of the library i you know i mean i i think englewood needs compassionate services for people experiencing homelessness and i also think it needs a library and uh, yeah. and the uh, I was, in fact, reading the library mission statement, <laughs> um, squinting at it without my glasses on, and it's a pretty good mission statement, and I hope it will remain uh, top of mind as, as the library moves forward. Yeah, I appreciate that, Scott. Um, and, 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 you know, I think one, just, just to add on one more little thing here, you know, um, the electronic locks in the restrooms, I've mentioned that a few times now, and, one, and part of that is uh, because of uh, certain behavioral concerns we have around those. And, and one of the behavioral concerns we have there is people using the restrooms to bathe. Um, you know, that's that's the sort of thing that, you know, that, that the electronic locks, you know, that's one of the tools that we have along with frequently patrolling to make sure that that's not the sort of thing that we're seeing happen in the library. Um, because it's really important to us that we, that we, main, that we maintain our focus on, on our mission. Um, so thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your, your thoughtfulness in this, Mark. And I think that, I think we just need regular updates. And I think that right now it seems to be working for everyone and that's positive. Yeah. So 
hopefully well, it stays that way. I look forward to it when when you're when all of you are able to visit the library again. Um, then we'll, you know, that we'll get they will be able you'll, you'll be able to give your eyewitness feedback, and that'll that'll be really really valuable because you'll certainly see things that we who are there every day don't don't see quite the same way. So, thank you. All right, staff's choice. I'm good, Kimberly. <laughs> Anyone? I just have one item and that's budget season. We are entering budget season now. And so Mark is, and his team, along with the rest of the visions of the department have been asked to look at personnel and programs and various services to determine uh, you know, if we need to ask for one-time monies to increase some of those items or something that would be ongoing like personnel possibly. So that's something that Mark is starting to dig into. And uh, in May, we're gonna be starting to input those requests and budgets into our system. And so I appreciate you all agreeing to give Kimberly a little bit more money for her programs this year. I think that's gonna be very valuable and she, she spends the money well. So thank you for the feedback on that. Thank and you. Uh, that's all I have. All right. Um, do we want to do a school board update first or so we don't forget Jen? <laughs> Go first so you don't forget me. Um, really, we're on the like downward slide right to the end of the school year. Um, it is really exciting because we do get to have some things actually in person instead of everything virtually. Um, so a lot of our award ceremonies and, and things like that, there will be at least some component of in person. Um, they also are doing a lot of live streaming dual events. So graduation will get to be in person live um, with some limitations and numbers and things like that. But just the fact that we get to actually have a graduation ceremony this year um, is wonderful for the kids. And, you know, they've, it's been a rough year for everybody. Um, and so for our seniors that are um, getting to actually have a ceremony, um, that's, that's good to, good to hear. So everybody's going to graduate on the same day on May 22nd. So Inglewood High School will be at 9 a.m. at the stadium, at the Randy Penn Stadium. Um, and then Colorado's Finest will be at one o'clock that afternoon. So that there's plenty of time to clean it, you know, kind of clean everything, get everybody out before the next round comes in. Um, so, the, I mean, I think that's, that's super exciting. Um, the art show, the district art show that is usually in the library um, is all virtual this year, <laughs> um, which, you know, it's interesting because I think sometimes, you know, Zoom gets a bad rap as a general because we're all Zoomed out, right? <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't want to do anything more, more virtual, but there are some nice things. Um, you know, our superintendent goes through and, and she um, asks to purchase so many um, art projects or art displays um, that are then purchased for the district. And so then they're displayed around the district and, you know, in the administration building and the boardroom and things like that. Um, and she was saying the other day that it's nice to be able to go through those art submissions and really take her time and not feel like, okay, I have to hurry and, you know, race through this because I've got something else going on. And she's like, it's nice to be able to just sit and, and look at them online and really make, you know, make a decision. So um, the art show is, is going on online right now. Um, so the kids have, have done all of um, all their artwork and able to submit it online. So um, other than that, you know, like I said, we're kind of wrapping up the year. Um, it is also budget season for us. We have to have a budget um, for next school year passed by, oh gosh, early June, um, I believe, at the very end of June at the very latest. Um, but usually we try and do that earlier. So I'm sure um, we've already had some budget discussions, but we will be seeing more of those come um, in the in the weeks to come. Um, well, there'll be a time for public comment and things like that. So, um, if you're interested in in that process, make sure that you tune into one of our board meetings, um, so you can hear what we're spending our money on. Um, unfortunately, evidently not as much on the library, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, unfortunately, schools are just as unfunded as libraries are. Um, uh, you know, so we, uh, we have all those unfunded mandates where we're mandated to do things, but we don't get any of the money to make that happen. 
Um, so, you know, you gotta love that, but, um, yeah, you know, we're just, we're looking forward to, you know, kind of summer and seeing the kids and, and being able to have some, um, you know, those traditional things. I know the Inglewood high school is going to have a prom, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of rules around it, but at least they get to have one. Um, so I think everybody's kind of looking forward to some of this, to things starting to feel a little bit more normal. Thanks, Jen. Um, all right, board members choice. I don't have anything. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to mention, uh, I got uh, I got my kids something. When I first saw it, I thought it was kind of a stupid <laughs> idea that, and a money grab that I'd never seen. But after a whole year of having, uh, my kids have way too many screens to look at all the time. Um, I, 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 I got my kids a, a a uh, Yodo player. Have you seen these things? Oh, I don't have the player here, but um, it, it's it's basically an audiobook uh, player. You can put these little like um, if you can see that RFID cards oh, cool. into the player. So this, and um, it happens to be all British, so you get to hear a Roald Dahl read by British people, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it allows the kids to play uh, different audiobooks and stories and um, uh, even That's some music cool. and stuff. And I think it's. It's just a really interesting uh, kind of thing to give us the kids get do their own thing and entertain themselves without looking at a screen. So, screen. Cool. Anyone else? No. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did visit the library twice, and I just wanted to um, give feedback on how nice it looks. It's really uncluttered. It's um, it's just displayed a lot nicer. I think it's the cleanest and most uncluttered I've ever seen the library. And I, I just really like that. It's hard for me to focus when things are cluttered. I can't, <laughs> I can't even look at anything. I just get too oh, distracted. Okay, don't so look too closely really at the staff desk because <laughs> that's the next frontier for us. So <laughs> thank you though. Well, I really look forward to uh, this uh, vaccine weight being up and coming to see the library. It sounds fabulous. That's that's my thing. <laughs> okay, done. Oh, I did. I do think. Yeah, the staff are taking really great precautions. I've gone in there a couple times, um, and it's, yeah. it now feel. At first, it didn't feel as safe to me actually, but it, like I came in last week, and it feels much safer than going to the grocery store. I think um, just with all the barriers and I mean, it's. It, it, always seem very excessive except for now, I think. <laughs> Later, there's a, people wearing gloves to check things in um, and all that. And I get frustrated by like the four day wait period for checking in books, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's very well done. Anything else? All right, um, the meeting is adjourned at 8, 11 p.m. All right. Good seeing everybody. Take Good care. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful one. Bye. Good to see you next month. Bye.